Good morning, everyone, and happy Saturday to you. I am sports mental health empowerment coach, Dr. Lauren Pitts, and this is House Talk pregame. Uh, my co-host extraordinaire, Ronnie Ransom, is not with us this morning, sending love and prayers and comfort out to he and his family during this time. Um, I'm going to take a second to breathe because when I say it has been a morning, it, it's been a morning, um, but I'm glad to be back and I look forward to and we look forward to this opportunity every Saturday to spend time with you, our viewing and listening audience and sharing this information with you and spending this quality time with you each and every single Saturday is so important to, to me and Ronnie. And we just look forward to it. You know, we don't uh, take this opportunity for granted. We um, we're humbled by it actually, because we know that um, you could be doing anything else. You could, you know, be doing, you know, whatever you want to do. So for those that are faithful in tuning in week after week after week, um, we humbly and graciously say thank you and appreciate you loving on us as, as we love on you. You know, there is so much going on in the world right now. And in the world, when I think about just how important sports are to, um, to global society, really, I mean, there's athletic involvement literally seemingly almost everywhere in the world. And there are many, 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 many student and professional athletes who have struggled with mental illness who, or who are currently struggling with mental illness. And what do we know to be true about mental illness? It is a very complex problem and physical, spiritual, environmental, and relational health are equally important in having good mental health. And it's so important for parents and family members, coaches, teammates, trainers, the media, literally everybody that's invested in the, um, the athlete's success to understand both the mental health risks and the benefits to ensure athletes have the greatest opportunity for success and to enjoy participating in sports. Let's face it, folks, Life is not always easy. And then when you add in that element of the pressure and the strain that is associated with athletic involvement or supporting uh, a scholar athlete or a professional athlete, um, it, it can be taxing. It can be taxing on everyone that is involved. And that's why we, we share this information with you. You know, it, it, that's what we're all about here at Pregame. We're all about educating and empowering and supporting and positively influencing the holistic, holistic performance of today's student and professional athletes, their family members, and everybody that's invested in their professional and their personal journey and really their life success. You know, um, for those of us that are parents or, or, you know, the coach, the trainer, whomever, you know, you, you want the person that you love and care about. You want this person that you're invested in to be successful. And, you know, a lot of people don't like it when we say that it takes a whole village to raise a child. But the reality of it is, is that whether you like the term or not, it, it takes a communal effort and community beyond the context of the community where we live, including that, but the campus community or, you know, the, the organization community. Um, it, it takes an entire team to support the athlete and the team in which the athlete participates in. So if you struggle to understand mental illness and have compassion for those affected by it, then you're in the right place because each and every week here on pregame, we share powerful, and I, I give the disclaimer every week, albeit raw, it is raw. Um, I just, I don't see any value 
in sugarcoating things. I don't see any value in, as my grandmother used to say, mamby pambying around these hard discussions that they're going on in our communities anyway. They're, they should be going on in our homes. They should be uh, not tap danced around, but what do we know to be true? Some of the conversations that we have here on pregame, they are not being had to the degree that they should be had in homes, in the locker room, in the community, in the school, in the department, in the organization. And we need to be having these conversations and not just talking about it, but the solution focused approach to putting systems and measures in place that help the scholar athlete and the professional athlete to be successful in and out of their sport involvement because you're not going to be an athlete forever. Um, there's going to be off season, life is gonna to continue to happen. And there are just things that need to be put in place. Um, the, the solution focused strategies, if you will, that need to be put in place to help all of our athletes and truth be told, everybody that's connected to them to be successful. Um, we want you to know that we share this information because it's, it's, it really is powerful. But think about it this way, the sports and mental health information that we share week after week on our show is needed in order to help you to make a well-informed athletic and oftentimes life transforming decisions. Here's the deal, folks. You know, I don't know how many of you are familiar with the phrase that what you don't know won't hurt you. That's one of the biggest lies that many of us were ever told as children. What you don't know can hurt you. And if you wanna put it in, in biblical terms, uh, the word of God says that my people perish for lack of knowledge. Ignorance is like cancer and it erodes the very foundation. It erodes the, the, the morality of, of our existence at times because we can perish. We can be caught with our pants down. We can find ourselves with our back up against the wall or in these compromising positions that we really could have avoided had we had the actual information and knew how to appropriately apply it so that we could make well-informed decisions and have a better understanding of what's going on around us and, and in our lives. So we wanna share this information with you so that you can make the appropriate life transforming decisions that you need to make. Um, we, we also, you know, there's, way, there's different ways that, that you can interact with, with me and Ronnie. Um, you can join us each week as part of our virtual audience by registering via the Zoom link that is posted throughout every single solitary day, uh, Monday through Saturday, um, to be a, a member of the virtual studio audience. You can also email us at htpregame at gmail.com because we really do wanna hear from you. We wanna know that we're not talking to the wall. We wanna know that you're finding value in these informative discussions that we're having week after week and that this information that we're sharing with you that you do find it helpful. Do you, you do see that if it's uh, applied in your life that it can help you to be much more um, effective and how you function and how you navigate your life and, and how you make sense of the athletic world and, and the regular world outside of the sport that you live in. Um, we also want you to remember that every Saturday at 11 a.m. right now at the, at the same time on HSRN, you can actually catch a, um, a, a pre-recorded episode of one of our previous shows and that airs at 11 a.m. on Saturdays at 10 p.m. on Saturdays. And you can also hear us at 10 p.m. on Sundays on Heritage Sports Radio Network. And for those of you that don't have the app, 
It's easy. Go to the App Store, put in Heritage Sports Radio Network, download that app and check it out. Not just our show, but I have a ton of colleagues on there. Um, Ted Wright, MJ Harrison, you know, we're doing the darn thing. Um, Thomas Hill, we've got some extraordinary, extraordinary shows on Heritage Sports Radio Network that are bringing awareness to so many different topics. Um, I forgot to mention Ryan Marshall. So they sees all about money. Y'all know you need more stuff, more stuff about money. Um, just a wealth of information for us as, as Black and Brown persons. And really, truth be told, anybody can benefit from this information. But because we are people of color and we are passionate about our communities, about our own people, about our HBCU families, um, we pride ourselves on informing our people, informing our own communities about this information that we have all become so blessed and so very fortunate to be obtained, sometimes by blood, sweat, and tears. Let's just go ahead and put that out there. So it's, it's sort of like on HSRN, we're serving as the global um, mentors, if you will, because what really is a mentor? A mentor is somebody that shares information with you based on their own learned experience. And you don't have to shed the blood, sweat, and tears, the heartache, and the pain that the rest of us went through to obtain that information the hard way. Uh -huh. And it's free. It's free. It's free. It's free. You can log into HSRN for free, though we do accept donations. Let's go ahead and put that on the market. You know, we ain't too proud. Um, but it's just so much powerful information that, if appropriately applied, can absolutely positively transform your life. So we encourage you to tune in and check us out on HSRN and check out all the rest of my colleagues too. I'm just some powerful, powerful shows that have some pertinent information. Uh, we have a great show lined up for you today. Um, I'm hoping that uh, in Ronnie's absence, I did invite a couple of guests that, and you know, total transparency, you know how I get down. Um, it was last minute, but I'm hoping that uh, folks will be able to make the, the minor adjustments to their schedule to join me later on in the show to share some very pertinent information with you. Um, before I get into all of that, um, today I'm going to be talking to you and we're, if my guests are able to join me, we're going to be talking about relationship boundaries. And I want to talk about relationship boundaries with you. As always, I'm going to give you a clinical perspective on that. Um, but we're going to talk about relationship boundaries in and out of sport because again, you know, athletic involvement or not, there is life beyond the game. Um, so I want to make sure that you have a clear understanding of what these boundaries are, how to establish them, what they should look like, what they should not look like, how do you impose them, how do you handle if a violation occurs, because if you live long enough, somebody somewhere more than likely is going to make an attempt to, to cross your boundaries. So wanting to make sure that you're aware of that. So as you know, Ronnie and I share a mental health tip every week. And my mental health tip um, today is actually connected to boundaries. And that is being the, the importance of understanding, first and foremost, what they are. Again, um, I'm going to share with you a wealth of, of knowledge today about boundaries and how to put them in place and to address them and, and, and what have you. And not only learning about them, but also being able to humble yourself and acknowledge if you have an area of opportunity when it comes to putting effective boundaries in place, because it can spare you a lot of heartache and pain and suffering and violation if you get a, a better understanding of what boundaries should look like in your relationships in and out of sport involvement. So we're gonna talk um, a lot about that today. That is the, 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 the meat and the, the gravy of today's show. Um, I wanna bring to your attention, you know, as you know, football season is back. We're super excited about it. Ronnie and I are diehard football. So I just wanna uh, share with you in case you're not aware, the classic schedule is posted. So on tomorrow, Sunday, at uh, 3 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. We have the Orange Blossom Classic on ESPN2, which is Florida A&M Rattlers. Go Rattlers, go Rattlers. I love my fam, you. Um, Florida A&M Rattlers against 
Coach Prime against Jackson State. That's going to be a good one. It's actually being held at Hard Rock Stadium in Miami Gardens, Florida. That is going to be the game to watch. So I'm definitely not going to miss that. Um, and then at 4 p.m. Eastern time on ESPN, ESPN Plus is the Black uh, College Hall of Fame Classic, which is Grambling State and Tennessee State. Dang, that's going to be a good one, too. Um, so you might want to check that out. And then at 6 p.m. Central Time, we have the Red Tails Classic on ESPNU, which is Fort Valley State and Tuskegee. So dang, all the HBCU games tomorrow are going to be really, 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 really good games. I'm going to tell you, um, I don't know if I'm going to get to that Fort Valley State game, but I am going to flip back and forth. I'm going, um, my, my focus is going to be on my Rattlers, um, but I'm also going to check out that Grambling State game because it's going to be a, an amazing, amazing game. I can't wait to see uh, what it looks like. And did y'all see? No. I think Ronnie and I talked about it next Saturday. So never mind. I was going to talk about that North Carolina Central game um, against uh, Alcorn State. It was crazy. That game was crazy. Um, but anyway, it's like I went to sleep and Alcorn State was winning. And then I woke up and Central had come back. And I'm like, wait, what the heck is going on? But it was a really good game. So football is back. We are excited about it and want to be able to talk about it week in and week out with you on top of all the other sports, too, because we've got some great stuff lined up for you. Um, but I'm going to go ahead and jump in. Um, you know, when you think about boundaries, uh, I want to give you some some context about what boundaries really are, and I'm going to give it to you in a, from a, a clinical perspective so that you have um, better understanding of what that's going to look like and feel like and be like when it translates into the athletic coach or athletic trainer or athletic teammate relationship. Um, so um, when you think about boundaries, I want you to, to look at it this way. Effective boundaries are designed to keep your relationships strong and healthy and appropriate. Boundaries refer to limits that you put in place to protect your well being. And within the context of sports, it is within the context of sports, boundaries is put in place not only to protect your well-being, but also to protect the ethics, if you will, um, and the morality of the, of the sport itself. So when you think about, um, when you think about what it looks like to, to put this in place, you also have to understand that it's extremely important to clearly communicate what your boundaries are. And if you don't know, how can you communicate effectively about something that you haven't clearly defined yet? So I want you to take into consideration that putting effective boundaries in place is going to require you to know yourself it's gonna require you to be able to communicate them effectively. And it's also going to be necessary for you to be able to establish the, the consequences that are going to accompany those boundaries if whomever violates them. The reality of it is, is that by your ability to effectively convey what your boundaries are on and off the, the, the field or the court or the diamond, it creates this opportunity for other people, coaches, trainers, teammates, you know, significant others, whomever, to understand what your expectations are within the context of that relationship. So here's the thing that you have to remember. In order to establish effective boundaries, you have to know yourself. I said that, and I'm going to keep saying that. 
How can you put something in place if you don't even know yourself? You have to know yourself and you have to be able to communicate those boundaries to other, others and follow through with the consequences. Well, Dr. Pitts, what the heck do, do you mean by a consequence? It's real simple. You, there are repercussions and consequences for breaking rules. Well, putting boundaries in place is actually treated with a consequence, right? So when I think about some of the greatest violations that have been experienced in the athletic arena, I think about the hundreds of gymnasts that were violated by uh, Lazar in the women's gymnastic team. It was 300 and I want to say it was like 360 some athletes that he violated over the, the course of his career with the U.S. gymnastics team. And then in addition to that, the, um, you know, when you read that story, you find out that when the FBI investigated, there were false statements given. In essence, there, there was a cover up. It's like, what the hell? Well, who who thought that was okay? Who thought that that was a good idea? But here's the thing. What it demonstrated is there needs to be greater clarity in and out of sport. Look at that cute baby. In and a, a, a future Hall of Famer right there, folks. Um, there needs to be clear boundaries that are established in order to be proactive in combating such horrific, horrific things from happening ever again. When you are able to put effective boundaries in place, what that conveys to others is that you have needs within the context of your relationship and the boundary is requiring other people to respect those needs you need to be able to say with great clarity when you are uncomfortable about something in that relationship dynamic and don't feel bad about it. Here's the thing, Dr. Pitts, you just don't understand, you know, I, I, I don't want to say something because I'm, I'm afraid I'm going to get benched. Nobody has a right to violate a boundary. There is no athletic involvement that is worth compromising you. And I, I, I get it. I know that these athletes out here live, breathe, and die these sports. But you know what happens when you don't have these effective boundaries in place and you don't tell when somebody violates? 10 years, 15, 20 years down the road, maybe even sooner than that, you end up in my office. You end up in Ronnie's office. You end up dealing with mental health issues and guilt and shame that you shouldn't have to deal with because you put more value in your athletic involvement than you did in your own well being. And that's what boundaries are all about. Boundaries are all about the health and strength of the relationship, but more importantly, it's all about your overall well being. So I shared with you in the intro that I may or may not have guests joining me today. I want to welcome into the, the studio my peeps, my peeps. They came through for Dr. Pitts, or as they call me, I'm their nanny. I am <laughs> I'm, I'm nanny. But look, this is Kelly Pace Wade, her amazing husband, Anthony Wade Jr., and future Hall of Famer, Kyra! <laughs> hey, baby boy! Hey! Power to the people! Yes! <laughs> um, so, you know, I've shared with the viewing and listening audience time and time again, for goodness gracious, the past three years now, that I am from a family of scholar athletes, virtually every freaking sport you can think of. Um, we play or have played in our family, and by far, these this amazing couple are two of the finest in, in track and in basketball, and both attended HBCUs, go University of Maryland, Eastern Shore. Hey. <laughs> so, so excited about that. Um, so I'm just going to give you some backstory um, on Kelly. 
Um, and then we'll let Tony chime in as, as he sees fit and Cairo can share his take too, as we will see what he has to say about Renat's relationship. Hey, Cairo, Cairo. Hi, baby. Mommy and daddy being good with your boundaries. They know they need to come and see about them. No, you're okay. Okay. <laughs> My boundaries. All right. So look, so it, it is an honor and a privilege to have you both with me today, particularly on such short notice. I know that Ronnie is just going to like, oh my gosh, tell your peeps. I said, thank you so much. <laughs> um, so Kelly uh, and Tony both attended University of Maryland Eastern Shore, but I'm giving you backstory on Kelly because she is the bomb. Um, I actually learned the phrase, walk them down. <laughs> And going to Miss Kelly's track meets here. I had never heard that expression before. And it's crazy because in high school, I always attended sporting events and stuff like that. You know, me and diehard sports and love, you know, I'm the crazy fan. It's like, oh, God, what's wrong? Her? Shut up. What is wrong? Um, but when I would go to Kelly's track meets, I'm like, yo, my cousin is the truth. Y'all don't know. And, and just for, let me set the stage for y'all. So, Kelly is my cousin. She is my mom's oldest sister's youngest daughter. But Kelly is like my baby sister, my second baby sister. So I got a biological baby sister. And then I got Kelly and her other sister, my Southeast boys, y'all. Her <laughs> other sister, Shannon, um, who was also a scholar athlete. And I actually invited her on today, too. She queuing. They up there barbecuing. Oh, I was going to say, they having a party. <laughs> yeah, they up there barbecuing in New Jersey. Um, but Kelly... Uh, actually started running track at the, uh-uh, don't be mad. Mm-hmm. Kelly actually started running track at the age of 12. And just to give you like the history of this. So her father, God bless him and, and rest in peace. Um, her father, my uncle Gio, uncle dad, AKA, um, was a, 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 a track runner as well at Spingarn High School in Washington, D.C. Because that's where that part of my peeps are from. They, they grew up in D.C. metro area. Um, and Kelly started running track at 12. And when I, I remember, and we were just talking about this last week, we had an idea from freaking the time Kelly started walking that she was going to be a daggone track star. When I say this girl from the time, I don't even remember you crawling. Like this girl came out the womb and started running. She like, I don't think she ever crawled or walked. She ran. She was like a daggone bullet around the house all the time. And it was like, what was the narrative in Aunt Pat and Uncle George's house when it came to Kelly? Kelly, stop running. Kelly, stop running. Kelly, stop running. Ke- Kelly, never stopped running, y'all. <laughs> Kelly never stopped running and started formally running track at the age of 12, ran for Frederick Douglass High School in Upper Marlboro, Maryland. So shout out to to Douglas High School and and all of the (laughs) athletic clubs there. Um, Kelly broke the school record for the 400 meter at Frederick Douglas. And I didn't get a chance to check, but I think you might still hold that record. One of them does. Yeah. Like. Still there. I checked like last year. I think one of them was still there. Yeah. The cow was beast mode. (laughs) And it's like, oh, man, man. I'm surprised. <laughs> but here's the other notable accomplishment. Kelly was also the Maryland State champion for the 400 meter. Now, do you remember what year it was you went to the Junior Olympics? Didn't you and Shannon go to the Junior Olympics in like Oklahoma City or somewhere one year? It was in Nebraska. Nebra- oh. <laughs> uh-huh. Oklahoma City. Yeah, that was. <laughs> That was um, the year after my freshman year, mm-hmm. because that freshman year we won states, we won team, mm-hmm. the team states, mm-hmm. and then that summer was Junior Olympics. Yeah, like I remember that we were so hyped. It's like that was so hype. <laughs> It's like, so, so tell us a little bit about that experience, just, pre- you know, preparing for that, you know, the Olympics just ended and we hear, you know, we heard about Simone Biles and the mental health strain and all of that. So share with us a little bit about what that experience was like for you in getting ready for that competition. And then what was it like when you got there? <laughs> we 
we just were talking about this the other day. Mm-hmm. But like, it's, I guess everybody's different. So mm-hmm. I never really was, I would be nervous before a race, but it'll be regular nerves. So mm-hmm. I was, would just be like, so hype. I was so ready to go because, mm-hmm. you know, the year before I didn't make it. And then like the year before I was disqualified. It was like, I qualified, but then I got disqualified after for mm-hmm. stepping on the line. Mm-hmm. So it was like everyone every year is like really high expectations. And then I never would make it. <laughs> Something yeah, would always yeah. happen. So this was the first year that I finally made it. And I mm-hmm. won region. So everybody was so hype. I was so ready. Yeah. <laughs> like, <laughs> so Family was hype. Like, yes. <laughs> the biggest part was getting the money together to go. Because I remember we like made this video. <laughs> I remember all of that. Yes. <laughs> We stood on the corner for, I mean, the whole team, we stood on the corner for money with buckets, like with race cars. Please, look, we'll work for money. <laughs> Please help us. Yes. We made this uh, video and then we um did like a fundraiser at church. That's mm-hmm. where I got most of the money to go. Mm-hmm. Sure. The, the check came through for you. National Church of God on Bob Road, in Austin Hill, Maryland. Yes. <laughs> Yeah. Yes. <laughs> I got enough for me and Shannon to go. Yes. Yes. I was the only one who actually was running. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Shannon went like as a chaperone. That was like the right. only me, the mommy. Shannon and the chaperone. <laughs> ah! <laughs> Shannon, hope you're listening. For real. <laughs> so it was like the only one mommy and daddy didn't come to. So yeah. we got there and I was so ready and it was so hot. <laughs> it was so <laughs> hot. It was so when we get there, they we hear on the um the new um like the news, they're saying that like everything is like code red or whatever it is. It's like a wow. heat wave, it's so hot. I'm like, of course. In Nebraska. Of course. That is I mean, crazy. I've never been. I didn't know not that hot there. I mean they well, that's why I'm like, like in Nebraska. It was crazy hot. So mm-hmm. it was even at night, like midnight, it was like uh-huh. 98 degrees. Oh gosh. It was and it wasn't any humidity. It was just <laughs> hot. Just fun. Look, just hell hot. Hard. Hell like, hot. Like it was, they had like ambulances on standby at the meet mm-hmm. because people were, of course, dehydrated and passing out. Yeah. So they would alter the meet a little bit and start a little earlier mm-hmm. in the like, prime of the day. They would take mm-hmm. a break and then we would run again at night. But mm-hmm. still, like the day I only ran the 400, mm-hmm. and the day that I ran, it was 107. <gasps> Oh my God. It was so hot. It was like, so the, you had to make sure that you, you know, stay hydrated and yeah. like basically move as little as possible to just retain all of the energy and everything that you eat. But it was crazy. I had never ran in heat like that. And I don't wow. think I have again. <laughs> but well, look, you like, it never was. Look, it never was. Like, it was so hot. Yeah. So, the day that I ran, it was 107, and I did horribly. Uh, I mean, and I couldn't figure out why. Like, I was so upset. Because you were melting? I couldn't figure out why. Even though it was really hot, I was like, you know, I prepared. Everyone, I mean, I prepared as well as I possibly could. Mm-hmm. I didn't feel overly stressed about this. I was like, ready. Like, this mm-hmm. is about to go great. <laughs> like, I'm going to win this race. <laughs> like, I mean, I wasn't necessarily saying I was going to win, but I was like, mm-hmm. really scouting the competition. I knew the times mm-hmm. that I was running and I was running faster every meet. So it was mm-hmm. like, in my mind, I was like, if I run a personal best today, I could get top three. This is going to happen. I'm like, <laughs> and then it totally did not manifest it. I'm going to think it and it's going to be so. The complete opposite is what happened. Like, <laughs> I got on that track. They had, you know, those big Gatorade, um, like the big ones that they sell Gatorades out of their field of ice. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like four feet high. Yeah. So they had those on the track, like right inside, filled with ice water and washcloths. Mm-hmm. It was crazy hot. So mm-hmm. we get on the track. I felt, I mean, it was hot, but I felt okay. But I guess I was just so fatigued. The heat wore on me to the, to wow. I didn't even realize until I was running. It was like, I couldn't access the, the speed or the oh, wow. energy. It was mm-hmm. just like, I did so bad. <laughs> I mean, I did bad for me. <laughs> I mean, right, 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 right. So it was like, and I just couldn't, I just couldn't figure it out. As soon as I crossed the finish line, like me and like three other girls, 
immediately drop down and take our shoe to take our shoes off because it was like they were melting. Wow. It was so hot. Our feet were on fire. We snatched our shoes off. People immediately ran over to you with an umbrella and water and poured. It was like, oh my God. It was like running in hell. <laughs> <laughs> like if this is what hell is like, I know I ain't going. <laughs> So, I mean, I did really bad. I did, I wow. ran like at the regional meet, I ran like a 56 something, which was a personal best for me at the time. Mm -hmm. I was 15, I think. Oh, wow. And then at nationals, I ran a 58, which mm -hmm. was horrible in my mind. Wow. <laughs> and wow. everyone else who knew me's mind. I mean, that's like two seconds is a lot in track. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. It's the I difference between gold or silver. silver. <laughs> I mean, two seconds could be the, the set between first and last. Like, that's a yeah. Wow. Wow, wow, wow. Yeah, I did horribly. So that was terrible. But <laughs> it was a really good experience. For the first look, well, you know what? What the seat of the equivalent benefit is, you, you learned that you don't want to go to hell. <laughs> right? And I definitely don't want to go there. And you learned my... shoes will melt. Right, right, and that's what I was saying, and that your shoes will not. So it's like, what the heck? So look, so so today, thank you, you know, and, and it, it's so important because, you know, today's show is about relationship boundaries. And as you were talking, I, you know, I'm, I'm visual, I see everything in life and pictures. And I was just imagining, you know, in situations like that, I, I, I think back to the actual Olympics and when some of the athletes didn't do as well as they thought and the coach yeah. or the trainer came over to them and, and hugged them or, or patted them on the shoulder and squeezed them and those sorts of things. And Especially what that looks form. like, you know, yeah. Like, what is that? What does that look like? Like how, what was your understanding if, if you don't mind sharing, um, concerning the importance of maintaining appropriate boundaries when you were playing, um, when you were running track, or even for you, Tony, when you were playing basketball. Because when I think about basketball, every time you turn around, somebody pat you on your butt. You're like, hey, I got to you linger a little bit. What's going on? But, but, and, and I say that in jest, but, but the reality of it is, what do we know to be true? There have been violations in the athletic world where coaches or trainers um, overstep their bounds. And when you reflect upon your athletic careers, did, did those conversations get had either by your parents or by coaches or trainers or by the athletic director? Did anybody ever talk about appropriate well, boundaries? Honestly, it comes down to honestly, the temperament of the player. It depends. Okay. That's where I, I would say personally, it starts because I mean, you know, I can only speak from my opinion, but, mm -hmm. you know, when you have an aggressive type player, like, you know, I I'm, was a very aggressive player, a very aggressive person, so, you know, things no. that I, I, don't, I don't like, I don't really let happen. You know what I mean? <laughs> so in a situation like, you know, like you were saying, I, uh, I thought it was funny the first time I told Kelly to come to a basketball game, you know, I, 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 I like I said, I'm so full of myself I knew like the game before I had like 35 points like you know within the three quarters I didn't even play in the fourth quarter so I just knew oh, this no. next game was just going to be really good so <laughs> when I met her I invited her out and the first thing happened I didn't I didn't play anywhere near my capability like <laughs> I, you know the first play of the game you know I'm, I'm dribbling the ball the dude like looks at me like a half court it was like literally like a one-on-one -on -one situation I like look up in the stands like see and smile and the dude steals the ball from me and he like goes and like dunks and then like she's looking at me like and then now everybody's like why what are you looking at and I'm like okay I don't really know uh, what just happened like that I'm like okay that's just that play fast forward to the fourth quarter I have like two points you know she's like pack, packing her stuff up like ready to go and I'm looking like I don't like to do no more I didn't even get to do my thing yet it's like the game is over like so you know that was like a disappointment and, you know that that stuck with me and you know the, the next time around you know I'm like okay the, the next game that she comes to I have to be very very aggressive 
So mm-hmm. my coach is like, okay, this game, you're not really going to play that much because <laughs> something was going. I was like, no, I got to play. Are you kidding me? I, I'm not going to take no. For that. Now, depending on the coach, he may say, you know, you're going to have to sit down. But I knew oh, in no. my heart that I had to prove something to my, my new girlfriend who's coming to my game for the second time. Now I'm not going to play. It's like, she's going to be like, what type of bum are you? <laughs> so in my mind, I... I so what you so look so my clinical interpretation y'all got me crying my clinical interpretation seriously okay serious clinical moment my clinical interpretation of what you're saying though is even though it wasn't overtly stated you put a physical and an emotional boundary in place with your coach it was like yo look out we're gonna let you you trip it off right now but I'm playing in this game this is this is my expectation. Bruh, I need you to honor it, like right now. <laughs> and you know, I'm just saying, a soft-spoken person may have taken sat on the bench or not have, you know, wanted to play or something like that. Yeah, or, and that's what I'm saying. I, I sometimes it depends on the the athlete. Like I can also give you another experience where I had <laughs> in, in coaching. Uh, me and my dad, we coached a championship basketball team. We went like 15 and 0, um, mm-hmm. but you know, it was it's fun my coaching style was from uh I let me show you how to do this mm-hmm. my dad is more of an x's and o's and okay. so we were coming up with you know the the coaching style used to be aggressive you're in the person's face you scream mm-hmm. you yell mm-hmm. so as time progressed I was trying to t- teach my dad that that is not the way certain things need to be handled when you're in yeah. a coaching environment because yeah. there is a time where you need to put a fire under a person, but there's mm-hmm. also a time where you need to kind of feed to the person's ego and kind of mm-hmm. build, but you have to play to the drama of the game. Mm-hmm. But the whole story is there was one time we were in a championship moment and my dad was using a, a coaching style. Was, he was very aggressive with the, with the, the, the player and mm-hmm. the, the player kind of melted down. And this is like a championship yeah. moment where this is one of our star players and he's melting down and we don't need this. So I kind of then pull the player to the side and it's almost like a Jekyll and Hyde situation. <laughs> I now play to his ego. Oh, come on, you're gonna do great. Go out there, we're, we're gonna win this game. Our coach is being hard on you because he knows we're gonna win and we need you. And yeah. then that perked him up. And mm-hmm. then once he went back to the game, he performed to the full level. But wow. to me, that was because that personality, he was able to, take it on and say, mm-hmm. you know what, I want this. I'm mm-hmm. going to now go and do good mm-hmm. in the game. Whereas we had, we had an opposite situation where mm-hmm. our player was melting down and he couldn't, he couldn't come back from it. He wow. literally shrunk into like, and this guy was scoring maybe like 15 points a game. Mm-hmm. And he literally shrunk in a championship moment and we need him, and we end up losing the game. Wow. And so wow. when we look back, we always say, that was because of the way that we approached that particular mm-hmm. player. Mm-hmm. He should not have been coached like that. Did right. we lose the game because of that? Maybe. We right. won a game because of it one time, but one right. time we lost. So right. I'm just saying more so you have to look at maybe the temperament of the player mm-hmm. and the temperament of the person mm-hmm. for kind of those type of traits. Mm-hmm. That That's that's actually a powerful, powerful point to make because uh, – you know, when I think about those different dynamics that you describe, it the same thing applies in our personal relationships, right? People have difficulty saying that they're uncomfortable. And I wonder if in the case of the athlete that you were able to get through to that shut down with your dad, if the kid was just not comfortable saying, hey, Coach Wade, I can't function when you come at me that way which was clearly a physical and an emotional boundary for him that wasn't clear and he can't function. Well, we see the same thing across all sports. We see that, you know, y'all know me and movies, right? Um, when I think about um, the, remember the Titans with the, the guy that was played by Donald Faze and Petey and where Boone came at him and I can't play with this man talking to me like this. And, He's fumbling and dropping passes and everything else. And then Coach Yost is, huh? I said, I I think think that probably happens in every coaching scenario. You always will have, I mean, I always had 
really good coaches, but I remember one coach mm-hmm. in particular mm-hmm. who was very, <laughs> this was when I was older. Now mm-hmm. this was for summer track. So, you know, summer track starts at five-year-olds and goes all the way up to 18-year-olds. Mm-hmm. So there's a wide range of, you know, but there's different mm-hmm. coaches for different age groups. Mm-hmm. There was one coach <laughs> who I didn't particularly mind, mm-hmm. but I know that a lot of people did mind. <laughs> Mm-hmm. He was very abrasive. Now he only coached the older kids, high school mm-hmm. age. Mm-hmm. But I worked with him when I was a little younger because of that was just good. <laughs> so look, you, you can go ahead and say we know. He was well. Go ahead. Go ahead. <laughs> so, so I practiced with the the older kids. Mm-hmm. But he every other word was a curse word. Wow. All he did was yell. I mean, that's the way he was. And it was like yeah. Either you would be seriously offended by it, of course. And of course, mm-hmm. if you're a parent in the stands at practice hearing someone, because even though he's not the coach of the children, the children mm-hmm. are there. We're holding yeah, the practice yeah. together on the same track, even right. though we're not doing the same thing. Mm-hmm. We're on the same track. They can hear him dropping F-bombs and, and just mm-hmm. like every like we can, you know. That's an intellectual boundary violation. So that that, that type of language in and in, in, in not being able to have that that to differentiate that but can continue I just wanted to point that out so yeah I would I always remember him he was a good coach Mm -hmm. but he had a specific coaching style if Mm -hmm. there was a kid who was maybe even though it's people always thought maybe I was I was I was quieter so I was soft Mm -hmm. but I wasn't I his he it didn't bother me at all. If he yelled at me, Kelly, you MF and better do blah 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 this F and try, you better run these GD times. I'd be like, all right. Oh, <laughs> I wow. Mean, I didn't have an issue with it, but that's how he would talk but to you as a kid. kid but then down. another kid, if you screaming and yelling and cursing at them like that, they're yeah. having no doubt, and they may not yeah. even be able to perform yeah. the way that you want them to ever. Well, you know, to that point though, I, mm-hmm. I'll even take it to an adult to like, you know, switching over to maybe a relationship. Yeah, yeah. I, I can I, we're avid gamers, so we game mm-hmm. really hard. You know, we're mm-hmm. playing video games and mm-hmm. it gets very competitive. So mm-hmm. there are certain times that when you know we're playing a very competitive game, you would mm-hmm. expect uh, you know, a certain level of competition. So there yeah. may be things said or something. You know how it is when you're competing in, you know, yep. any sport or any. But yep. but this example, I noticed when we were first, when we first started gaming, I, you know, again, maybe this was a boundary that I crossed. <laughs> I'm used to being a leader. When it comes to being on the court, off the court, uh-huh. I'm a leader. So uh-huh. when we're playing a video game, I, in my mind, I'm the leader. I'm, I am the you leader. Ain't you know, and I don't even mean to do it. It's like, okay, we're playing Call of Duty. You want to go right? No, the team says we're going left. Who's the team? I'm the team. <laughs> the team says we're going left. And so what I what I noticed in doing something like that for years, it took me maybe about two or three years to pick up. Every time now we play a video game, it's a somber time. I'm like, why are we have we we're about to play the funnest game on earth? No, because you have to basically I'm playing with both controllers. So I found out really, really quickly. Oh, when I'm in control, it's not as fun. I said, you know what? Let's let's try this. This is two years later. You know, it took me two years. I said, let's try this. I'm not going to say anything. We're going to play this game a totally different way. Let's Mm -hmm. just do whatever. If if you want to go over here and jump off the bridge five times, let's just do it. So with, with that being said, she took it as, you know what, I'm going to show him I'm equally as good in these games. I can be the leader. And now I sit back and I watch. And guess what? Now, fast forward to like 11 years later, we have the funnest time playing video game. Now, oh, now you're the whole leader. She, she's the leader now. Well, now we play the game, we're looking at, okay, so are you going to lead us to this place? Or this? Now, it, it's, it's, it's just to me a boundary that was now figured out by me, like I said, nice. at first, it was one thing. It it had it was my way or the highway when we playing mm-hmm. video games. And I noticed, you know what, it doesn't have to be like that. And then that triggered over into life. I started yeah. you know, what about if you start to let up a little bit in this aspect? Oh, you yeah. can do that. You can do this. I'm just saying to me, you have to have an open mind to s- certain things to let 
these boundaries be in place or yeah. I don't think it can be possible for you to have boundaries. Mm-hmm. So I'm just, I'm, I'm going at the person, the personality mm-hmm. traits, the more mental mm-hmm. aspect of it, because to me, yeah. you have to be willing to do some of this stuff. And if you're oh, not, yeah. you know, mm-hmm. it's, it's just, to me, it's just like talk. Yeah. It's, and when you say that, Tony, it reminds me of literally a conversation that I had yesterday. And this brings in the power dynamic between coach and athlete. So I know that you're both in a position to speak to this. So when you look at the power dynamic between coach and athlete, as you can imagine, one of the things that I see clinically with the athletes that I work with is that you have some of these coaches out there that abuse their power. And that's particularly concerning when you talk about the, the, the athletes that melt down, because to melt down under that type of, of coaching style tells me clinically there's something deeper going on. The horror of that type of dynamic is that there, what I'm learning is that there are coaches who are predatory at times, right? They pride themselves on targeting the weaker vessel on the team. So even though this athlete may have extraordinary athletic ability, emotionally they're vulnerable and that puts them in this very compromising position. So can either of you speak to what your experience has been with that, that power dynamic in the coach athlete relationship? Well, it's, it's kind of funny. Like when I would say when you're an athlete who, I mean, even though on a far smaller scale, but when I was in high school, I was one of the top track athletes at the time Mm -hmm. in the state anyway. Mm -hmm. (laughs) So uh, you, as an athlete who is good or Mm -hmm. who, you know, is at the time or, you know, Mm -hmm. whatever, Mm -hmm. there is a lot of pressure for you to be good. (laughs) Mm -hmm. Even if people don't necessarily mean for it to be. Mm -hmm. So like, I remember the first time I got injured Mm -hmm. and I did kind of get injury prone eventually. (laughs) Mm -hmm. So when I um, tore my um, meniscus, I remember that was my senior Mm -hmm. year. Mm -hmm. So it was like the worst possible time for it to happen. Mm -hmm. (laughs) So it wasn't, I I remember exactly when it happened. We were in practice and Mm -hmm. It was like a Saturday morning practice or something. I was just doing, we were just doing warm up drills regular and I mm-hmm. felt the pop. Mm-hmm. It wasn't excruciating, but it felt, you know, it was obvious that something was, you know. So mm-hmm. I stopped, I like, you know, bent my leg. It felt a little weird, <laughs> but not excruciating. Yeah. And I do have a pretty good threshold for pain. So mm-hmm. I mean, it's a family it tree. Out, <laughs> it didn't outright, it wasn't like a sharp, you know, it just mm-hmm. kind of felt weird. So I was like, uh, and so then I just kept mm-hmm. going. I told, but it was right before championship time. Wow. So it was like, um, I, t- I didn't tell my coach immediately because it's just the it pathway pressure from myself because it's yeah. like my senior mm-hmm. year, which is mm-hmm. like, the most serious time if you're trying to get into college for schools are looking at you everybody's yeah. coming to regionals and states so yeah. so I didn't say anything at first but then Kelly did you tell did you tell your mom and dad uh-uh okay go ahead not at first not that like mm-hmm. day so mm-hmm. I finished mm-hmm. practice it was okay and then like I one of the next practice I remember I st- it started to kind of bother me a little bit Mm -hmm. on and off it might feel okay for a couple minutes and then you Mm -hmm. know it was just weird Mm -hmm. I wasn't really sure what had happened so (laughs) but I just knew my knee felt weird Mm -hmm. so like at one point we were practicing and I wasn't I always everybody knew I always was the person who went like I was like a try hard is what you call Mm -hmm. (laughs) your practice I went like on 10 all the time Mm -hmm. you knew it Kelly was Mm -hmm. not gonna chill she was not gonna you know if the coach was like if somebody is if somebody is, uh, you know, they were, I would the one be get the chainmen in trouble, basically. It's mm-hmm. like Kelly's running five seconds fast, and y'all, while y'all going so slow, she's she's not tired. So why are y'all tired? And it's like Kelly, I'm about to kill you. It's like right. I didn't have any remorse. You're setting the it's standard like, up here for everybody. Uh-huh. Yeah, it's like I'm yeah. trying to win, aren't y'all? Like, yeah. <laughs> ain't we a team? We supposed to be trying to win. Like mm-hmm. y'all better stop stop playing. So right. I was going on ten all the time. So mm-hmm. if I was looking like a little funny. Somebody was going to notice. 
Mm-hmm. So my coach said something one time, but it was like the way he said it, it was like, Kelly, stop playing around in practice. I'm like, when do I ever play around in practice? Because I had stopped because right. my knee was feeling funny. Right. And he just like made a comment. And mm-hmm. it's like, it kind of like rubbed me the wrong way. It's like, when do I ever play around in practice? Right. Like he didn't even inquire like, is the, what's in going practice, on. It would never be me. I never play. Right, right. Practice. <laughs> I'm practicing. Right. <laughs> like, mm-hmm. I'm staying two hours after practice, you know? Mm-hmm. What you mean? What am I playing? You, he didn't right. stop and say, is something up? Is, are you okay? Right, right. He just made a comment. So mm-hmm. I was like feeling some kind of way about that, I remember. But mm-hmm. I didn't say anything really until the morning of the regional championships. We get to the meet. Oh, and shoot. my knee is as big as a balloon. And so it was like I couldn't hide it anymore at that right. point. So we, all the girls had gone into the bathroom to like just use it when we first got to the meet. And I mm-hmm. pulled my pants down and my leg is like the knee is obviously big. So I was like, oh, Lord. And it felt horrible. Mm-hmm. so then I had to go down and tell <laughs> so it was the morning of regional oh goodness so I ran in regionals and I did pretty good I mean we iced it we took as good as care of it we could mm-hmm. I went to regions I won regionals and we went to states but I didn't win but I got like second or something mm-hmm. it was like okay but then I had to take off the, the tour meniscus outdoor season you you won so regionals and came in second in states with a torn meniscus. Therapy and stuff. So I had to take off ninety percent of my senior season of outdoor, which is the biggest, you know, the most important right. indoor. Right. People care about indoor, but not really. Yeah. I came back just in time for championships, but mm-hmm. I hadn't really run too much previous to that. Mm-hmm. So I did like mediocre at best. So all mm-hmm. the schools that were looking at me, the big schools, it's like it dwindled down to yeah. not much because I didn't really have a season senior year. Yeah. And senior, mm-hmm. and then wow. once I got to Eastern Shore freshman mm-hmm. year, mm-hmm. I tore it again. Yeah. So mm-hmm. it was really hard then because I was on scholarship. Mm-hmm. And when you're on scholarship, you feel a pressure to do Mm-hmm. anything no matter what, what it is. <laughs> it's like yeah. at the mercy of the school like if mm-hmm. my legs fall off I'm gonna run right it's like yeah. so I told the coach that my knee was feeling funny I remember and he told me to go see the trainer mm-hmm. the trainer took me to go get an MRI and it was torn again same one that I had just done senior year because it was like I, I may have I probably rushed coming back but I just mm-hmm. I had to run out of the season like a little yeah. bit yeah. so I could get some times for schools to look at yeah so, the so let me ask you a question about ran that. Me into the ground. He didn't really seem to care that I was injured. And it was like, it became a, a headbutting thing with the mm-hmm. coach and the trainer, the trainer mm-hmm. saying she really shouldn't be running her, her meniscus. It wasn't fully torn again, but it was like, if you mm-hmm. keep running her, she, it's going to tear all the way. Yeah. And he just was. He like was, him. Yeah. So let me ask you, so, <laughs> so let's go back to high school pressure, for a pressure, second. pressure. And then I just quit. Right. So in high school, so, you know, we clearly defined the, the track coach at UMES. Um, did you feel that that, because emo- what you're describing is, again, the violation of the physical and the emotional boundaries between coach and athlete. But what I appreciate you saying is that the trainer respected that this athlete should not be running. Do you find yeah, that, that that trainers will they stand up for you all more frequently than I coaches that are like, no, you gotta, you gotta. Like the situation. But honestly, the coach mm-hmm. is going to outrank yeah. anything. It's like they can oh, say wow. something, but they're just like a, they are. They may be even a student. You know what I mean? Some of the trainers, mm-hmm. yeah, a lot of may the trainers be were students. So now, oh, wow. Was, wow, this is two thousand three. Yeah. So mm-hmm. I would think things have changed yeah. maybe in yeah. that. But our, mm-hmm. our coach was very, he was a very hard coach. He mm-hmm. practiced us very hard. Mm-hmm. And not that that's bad. I expected it. I'm going to a D1 mm-hmm. school. I'm mm-hmm. expecting the practice. We did two yeah. days. It was really hard. But mm-hmm. I mean, I didn't have a problem with it. Mm-hmm. I didn't really feel, I felt okay. I mean, I ate a lot. I gained a ton of weight, mm-hmm. <laughs> but it was muscle weight. Because yeah. all we did was lift and run. And when I ate, I ate like a football player. It was mm-hmm. <laughs> to yeah. replenish because all we did was just 
We ran. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I remember so, you. Yeah, you was you was straight rock back then. It's like that door. It was like that door. I Kelly, you got body for days. I went from one fifteen to one thirty, mm-hmm. and it was all muscle. In like a couple of months, because we used to have weigh ins. Mm-hmm. But it was it was it was hard work. So mm-hmm. my knee. So after that, it was like I I felt so pressured to run, but at the mm-hmm. same time, my knee felt so horrible. Like mm-hmm. it was so painful. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I was and then I was just so stressed about it. I mm-hmm. just like. I guess I'm down with track. <laughs> wow. 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 So, so Tony, let me, I came home and I took that semester off. Yep. I, I remember that. Back. And then mm-hmm. I went back just as a regular yeah. student. Yeah. I, um, Tony, I want to ask you a question from a coaching perspective. When you, when you started coaching and you look at the coach's responsibility for maintaining appropriate communication boundaries, physical boundaries, location boundaries. And we didn't, we haven't even touched on sexual relationships. I'm going to get into that in a second. Was that based on your experience as a coach, were these conversations had directly or were they just sort of implied? It just, it, that depends on what group type of group you're coaching like you know i okay. coach from a younger where there's you know like uh like four yeah age. four or five up mm-hmm. to you know you know adults so mm-hmm. you know when you're dealing with adults it's mm-hmm. different than dealing with a four or five year old mm-hmm. there's certain things mm-hmm. you can you know run past an adult in you know the the sports you know it's it's kind of to me it's it's almost like you know, when you're dealing with the adults, you kind of have to watch egos and things of that nature. Yeah. So when you're dealing with a little kid, mm-hmm. there's mm-hmm. there's a certain level of ego. Maybe when you get to maybe the you know a uh, teenage, because mm-hmm. now this kid wants to be a player he's seen on TV and mm-hmm. this and that. So there mm-hmm. are those things you have to deal with. But I think honestly, you know, when it comes to that, that's more so when you're dealing with adults. Mm-hmm. So, or an uh, older age group in coaching. Okay. But, okay. I mean, I can just, I just remember, you know, coaching is, is so different at this point. You know, mm-hmm. it's it's a different, it's a different level now to me, honestly, because like mm-hmm. you have, whereas Boys and Girls Club, mm-hmm. they now have allowed uh, AAU basketball teams to, to now go into the, you know, Boys and Girls Club. Oh wow! When, okay. When I when I got into coaching, I started with boys and girls club because it was mm-hmm. almost like giving back to the community. Yeah, you, know, yeah. you give kind of teachings that you weren't taught, and you know you mm-hmm. give back. So now you can have a kid that may you know all he needed was your voice, and now he he can become an NBA player or something. Yeah, yeah. better. maybe he even becomes a better man. You know yeah, I mean? yeah, that is kind of what you aim for. But now it's to me everything is just about money and you know winning and yeah yeah you can't even really get the you know kind of i'm not saying that people still don't give that those type of teaching and positive messages but Mm -hmm. it's a it's it's a different level of thinking in the world and Mm -hmm. mentality these days Mm -hmm. where Mm -hmm. you know especially with sports it's like you know everybody wants to be what they see on tv and yeah you you see this and don't think you have to work hard to do it right so those are the type of things in coaching that we used to look for Mm -hmm. i mean me personally uh and this is going back to speak on the power of coaching when i was in high school uh my coach my coach and my dad they used to get into it a lot because my dad was a coach too so i was going to ask you all to speak to the parental aspect of it go ahead so my so Mm -hmm. and i can go even further Mm -hmm. you know i remember when my dad coached me there mm-hmm. was a time where you know I would have to perform because when I show up to the gym, I'm in the starting five. People thinking it's because of my dad. Yeah, That's yeah, not yeah. the case. I'm in the you starting know. five because I'm better than you. So <laughs> this and this was on my mentality through life. So yeah. Now, any gym I go to, I have to prove to somebody. Even now, and she <laughs> she says all the time. Who are you talking to? You're like, you know, you 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 think like, you know, you have to make something up to in order for you know your your fuel to get run. I was right. the other day and some guy just looked at me. Where I said, oh, you know what? This guy must want it with me. He must want to eat. <laughs> <laughs> the shows that you know he wants. 
But I think, like I said, it's, it goes back to a, a mentality and a power perspective. But in high school, my dad and my coach used to get into it to the point where the coach used to bench me because he was mad at what my dad would say. So we would lose games by like 15, 20 points. And again, this is, you know, a basketball X's and O's, but he mm -hmm. used to run a zone defense and mm -hmm. we're losing by 15 points. So we would be losing and we're just sitting back waiting for the team to now just come and punish us more and more <laughs> as opposed to running a man defense. And now we can check and let our yeah. individual defensive skill show. Yeah. We had individual defenders. So yeah. he was basically forcing us to do one thing because that's what he was taught throughout. His, his ego got yeah. it and he started power tripping off the ego because he was so managing your head. Wow. Them challenge him on things of that nature and mm -hmm. then you know i would go from being into the starting five to now i'm not even playing the game so i go uh -huh. from my 11th and 12th grade year where i'm looking to you know get college looks and things of that nature yeah and him and my dad are beefing to the point where some days i, I know i'm going to go in he would even put me in with 44 seconds left in the game that would used to be the worst wow I, I go, and look down at the bench hey tony you want to go in it's like no, I don't want to go. But now I don't want to say no because I do want to go in. And the funny thing is, in those 44 seconds, I used to come in and still score two or three points. So, that was the thing. so in my mind, I said, you know what? The second that I become a coach or I get away from this, I'm yeah. going to have a totally different perspective because mm -hmm. in, a, in a way, that was an, a, a way of mentally abusing me for mm -hmm. A problem I like with my dad. Yeah. And like I, I will say, that strengthened me going forward. That mm -hmm. always lingered in the back of my mind. Any mm -hmm. gym that I stepped in from that point on, I said, mm -hmm. you know what? I got to be the best player in this gym because I'm not going to give the coach a chance to yeah. even say or power trip me because if mm -hmm. he does, it's going to look bad on him. Yeah. And I'm yeah. just saying the, the the power of a coach is really strong. And becoming mm -hmm. a coach, I realized that. So mm -hmm. what I used to do was I used to try to empower the 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 player by yeah. you know good things by, mm -hmm. by also being 100% real too. Mm -hmm. If you're coming out here and you're trying to play like Allen Iverson or Kobe Bryant and that's not what you do, I'm right. going to show you and tell you that's not what you do. Now right. from what you how you go about that, that's fine. But the yeah. difference between how me and my dad used to coach was mm -hmm. my dad would get you on a more X and O's where I mm -hmm. wouldn't even talk about X and O's. This mm -hmm. is the X and O's. Let's come out here. You play one-on-one. Mm -hmm. -on -one. I'm going to yeah. show you what your faults are while we're yeah. playing. Oh, you yeah. can't play defense? I'm out here shooting threes on you until you come out here and right. run. And then at right. the end of the day, that may be something mental too, but you know the difference is I don't mm -hmm. leave the court now after you have been demoralized by what I just showed you. Right. I come and pull you to the side and say, yeah. this is how you can become better. Did you just see what I just did to you? Do you right. want to do this to people? Do you right. want to learn how to be the best player you possibly can be? And if right. the correct answer is no, then that's fine. We just had right. a nice game of one-on-one. -on -one. Right. And if the answer is yes, I'm going to do my best to, to empower you and show you and get you to that next level. But right. that goes back to, like I said, the, the personality trait of mm -hmm. the player mm -hmm. so, i mean but, but what you just described though and, and you ex described it beautifully so when you look so clinically when i look at communication uh boundaries between coach and athlete it's you know my clinical recommendation is is that in order to maintain appropriate communication boundaries coaches need to always consider what they say and how they say it because how the player interpret it interprets it is going to impact how they perform. The other thing that you said that's really powerful is that you have to always take into consideration how you're providing feedback and providing feedback in a way that relates directly to performance and not that's a per, that's not a personal attack against the the human being. Addressing the behavior, i.e. the athletic performance, that's critical, critical. And then when you talked about the physical boundaries, it's like, you know, it's, I always think about appropriate touch and, and not touch, right? Like you can, you can touch a player in a way that's positioning them the way that you want or, or motioning for them to do something. But what we're seeing is these occasions where 
athletes in, in particularly when I when I think about the the scholar athlete at like the middle school level or you know even the, the younger kids up through high school it's athletes being touched in a way that's inappropriate and not relevant and not relevant to their skill development and what would be your recommendation if, if you have one as to from a coaching perspective and from an athlete perspective on how to navigate that piece. Cause we know Cairo's going to be a hall of famer. So what conversation well, could you have with him as a parent? Well, just thinking, honestly, like I said, I think the coaching and just the, just pretty much sports in general has changed because like I said, they're back in the day, you know, 2000, 2006, mm-hmm. when we were, you know, Bob Knight, you know, he was out there throwing chairs and, you know, mm-hmm. back in the day, you can get up to a coat, get up yeah. to a player and you, that's what I was raised on. And again, maybe yeah. this is why I'm so physical because yeah. that's the type of coaching that I'm used mm-hmm. to. I'm used to it in your face of a person building your, building you up you know, screaming and yelling. If you're not mm-hmm. screaming and yelling, to me, you're not into the game. But that, <laughs> but, but I, I, again, I've learned mm-hmm. you don't have to take that tone and that direction of coaching mm-hmm. now. Mm-hmm. Back then, that's all I knew. When we would, mm-hmm. when we would go into our high school games, and I always go back to my high school because I always mm-hmm. say he was the worst coach in the world. I <laughs> honestly don't even know how how I became. Like Ronnie good. talking about his coach. You know what I mean? So this is like, look, Aaron, Aaron my grievances from my high school coach that but <laughs> honestly, my, my high school coach did teach me one thing that was honestly one of the more fundamental things in basketball that I never will forget, but that's on a mm-hmm. skill. Develop. But as far as mental and uh, physical, you know, mm-hmm. he would put you in a position. If he wants you to, you go over here and you go mm-hmm. over here and you can, like I said, you can do that to younger mm-hmm. You can't do that to a college athlete, you know, I mean, unless you're on scholarship and sometimes Mm -hmm. I I see that too, where Mm -hmm. a coach is very physical because, oh, I know that you are on scholarship, so you're not going to punch me. You're not going to, but then there's, you know, some of the people that just don't care or they're so good that they can do certain things. Right. Like I said, I've learned from, from watching that and watching that power. If you Mm -hmm. really want to coach someone good and coach, you have to literally be in the trenches with them. That's mm-hmm. to me how, you know, you can you can be a bad coach, but if you're, to me, if you're there in the trenches with them, mm-hmm. that just that emotional support, that love, mm-hmm. that, that just, oh my God, he's still showing, he may not know what he's doing, but mm-hmm. even with that level of support, if you're mm-hmm. emotionally good and supporting, that mm-hmm. can go so much further with even yeah. how you build your development with players, with yeah. the other people around you. So yeah. I'm just saying to me, you know, being a coach is, it's like being a counselor. It's like being, yeah. it's like a yeah. lot of, you have a lot of different niches because you have a lot of different personalities you deal mm-hmm. with. Mm-hmm. So I just think honestly, you know, being a coach and having that coach player development, that puts mm-hmm. you as the coach and mm-hmm. as a player in a very vulnerable state because you right. may listen to some things that you don't really, you know, you don't know or because you're trying mm-hmm. to learn or accept mm-hmm. something new, you mm-hmm. may be more open to listen to things and more open to right. suggestion. And if you're using that type of power in the wrong way, I can see how you can get into that position because yeah. like I said, as coaching little kids, the second they walk in the door, you know, I see them. So yeah. I, I may be shooting around. And I'm, I may be missing. The second my superstar athlete comes in, I'm definitely making all of my shots. I'm going to yeah. the back. I'm look, he's looking at me, trying to see. Yeah. He's yeah. ready to uh, absorb anything that I tell him. So yeah. I know with that power, oh, you know what? Not only can I push you to be a better athlete, but mm-hmm. I don't know all that it takes to be a good man and a good human. But, you know, the things that I have learned that I have had success with, these are the moments where I can share with you. And yeah. like I said, that just depends on how, how you are as a person, as a coach. You yeah. have that power to manipulate, mm-hmm. but mm-hmm. it's pretty much on you on how you use it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I will say, because of being a girl. Yeah. In sports now, in high school, we had a trainer mm-hmm. initially, 
Mm-hmm. My first couple of years, we had a trainer. And then obviously in college, we had a trainer, but it's like in college, it's far larger scale. So mm-hmm. there's more, there's the head trainer, but then there's a lot of students usually who are mm-hmm. in the physical therapy or in there, you know, they're like the, yeah. so it's a lot of times if a girl will come in, a girl would work on you. I was going to ask you, is there Not a, all the time, that but happen? most of the time. Mm-hmm. And, most of the time, if it wasn't a girl, it mm-hmm. was the head trainer who was doing it or okay. his like direct assistant. Okay. But like in high school, in for track where we get like rub downs or they're oh. stretching you. I'm laughing at the baby. I'm not laughing at you. <laughs> I'm sorry. I love you. <laughs> so <laughs> you got to get like these rub downs and they rub the stuff, you know, rub your muscles out, stretch you. The trainer was a guy, but I could see how that could easily be abused by a guy. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Especially if a if it's a girl who isn't going to speak up or Mm -hmm. I mean you don't especially I mean in my mind some things you think are common sense, but Mm -hmm. they aren't for everybody. Right. Right. (laughs) Like, you know what I mean? If somebody, okay, you're going to attract me. And before every race, he said, go to the trainer. He'll stretch mm-hmm. you. He'll rub you down. If if you need it, uh, put mm-hmm. the, you know, type of balm on your legs or whatever. Mm-hmm. Wrap mm-hmm. you if you have a muscle injury. You know, that type of stuff. Wrap uh-huh. your ankle, God, whatever. Mm-hmm. So he's laying on your back. He's between your legs, stretching your legs, doing all types. I mean, you know, he's mm-hmm. all rubbing your butt muscle. I mean, everything pretty much. Mm-hmm. So... He's doing your hamstrings, your, you know, but mm-hmm. so it's like if you don't know. If I mean it's like in my mind, you should know, but I guess because I've run track for so long. Because the touch I would imagine like, is know, very different. It's like if somebody's it's like, okay, you stretch your coat, your trainer stretched you, and it's like, okay, you don't know what a stretch is supposed to be like. I mean, oh, this is how they stretch you don't know. School. It's you know like I mean? this is you thought that was okay. I mean, you know what I mean? It's like you think it's common sense, but maybe yeah. not. So it may be easy for a coach or a trainer mm-hmm. to do. It's like he told you, you need to take your clothes off to be grubbed down. No, <laughs> right. So let me like, ask you this: but you that's not what that, happened. That there are there are timid athletes that would they would just go, you would they would that, know it yeah. and yeah. along with it. And it's like yo, you come back. Oh, where were you at? Oh, I was in the locker room over there. Why? So I mean, at a track meet, you know, usually you're outside. So it mm-hmm. is nine times out of ten you're getting a public a Mm -hmm. ton of people Mm -hmm. around while you're warming up Mm -hmm. or getting rubbed down the whole team Mm -hmm. i mean you know it's just that's how it is in a track meet right but it may be easy if you're getting stretched you know have you seen somebody laying on their back they have your leg Mm -hmm. up they're in between their legs like they're like your crotch to crotch pretty much they should be a distance away from you you shouldn't be feeling Mm -hmm. Well, let me ask you this, because what you all are talking about is location boundaries. And so my clinical recommendation is that coaches and trainers really should avoid being alone with the athlete. So what does that look like? Like, are there are there multiple trainers in the area where stretching is going on? Because so that seems like a recipe for disaster. We're, we're, we're coming so, from 2000 and. Uh, 2006, 2000. I mean, okay. In 2021, I'm sure there's way more boundaries and things of that nature now yeah, yeah, yeah. set in place. Not yeah. saying that there's not, you know. I mean, well, I'll say at a track, 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 track me is just a place where it's mm-hmm. a lot of people everywhere. Mm-hmm. You're not really going to be able to find mm-hmm. a mm-hmm. place where there isn't anybody. I mean, most mm-hmm. of the time, if you're staying in the general location of what mm-hmm. the track meet is. So, mm-hmm. so there's usually a general warm up area. People are running. I mean, there's not really mm-hmm. any secluded place probably mm-hmm. that you could go. And now, mm-hmm. like in 2021, if you're like a coach, like I said, if you're very aggressive and you know you're touching and physically, or you're in someone's face, mm-hmm. someone's going to pull their camera out on you so quick, and that's going to be the last time that you do that because yeah, yeah. The, those boundaries can't be crossed now. And I hate to say it, but you know mm-hmm. maybe that's a mental thing too, but I think that has softened everyone up, even in mm-hmm. sports. Sports is a little bit softer now than it used to be. And we can go to facts. I always go to facts. Look at the NFL. You can't get people coming across the middle and do anything. Yeah. A yeah. flagrant two foul. A flagrant yeah. two foul in 2001 is not what a flagrant two foul looks like in 2021. Mm-hmm. 
These yeah. are different boundaries now. They have mm -hmm. been set and established because of those past mistakes. And I think mm -hmm. they're trying to make up for some of that now. So okay. I think it's a little harder to, to cross those type of boundaries where you okay. get someone alone and now you're mm -hmm. a male and you're, mm -hmm. uh, you know, yeah. so I, I think that more that more is yeah, aware savvy of, of the situation. They're more willing to speak up now mm -hmm. than before, but. You grab a kid by his shirt now at one of these AU games, the it's mom and dad is definitely having a problem with you and you're definitely not being able to coach anymore. Yeah. Because yeah. back yeah, in the like, day, you grab a player by the everybody by the shirt. <laughs> I mean, like right. I'm saying, my the coach I was talking about, the way he used to curse at us. But I mean, I didn't have a problem with it. It yes. I mean, it was I it didn't it really affect me at all because mm -hmm. I just knew that was him. I don't even think he knew how to talk without cursing. I mean, so let me, so let me ask you this, fun. Kelly. So if there was an athlete that took issue with it, oh, were there? Heard. He used but to did they? But did they speak the up and express it though? Really? He did actually? I think he actually might have gotten fired later, eventually later, later on yeah. because I, he well. did actually. I think he was actually a teacher as well. Wow. Okay. Now I don't know if he was like that as the teacher in class, but yeah. as a coach on the field, that's what he was. What he was. And okay. I, I knew, I mean, you could just, as soon as you come in, he was, he had a big mm -hmm. mouth. He was the loudest voice you heard. Just mm -hmm. curse, 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 curse. And mm -hmm. I mean, that type of coaching, any type of a coaching worked for me. Okay. Because I just was so eager to get better. That's all I yeah. cared about. I didn't care what you said. I mean, not, I didn't right. care what you said. I, know what you mean. I never felt like anybody crossed the line with me. I mean, right. everybody that I had a coach was coaching me. I felt like they genuinely wanted me to get better, no matter the style. They may be a little harsher. They may mm -hmm. be a little softer. They may mm -hmm. be, I mean, I was just trying to get better. Whatever you had to say, I was about to listen. Now, if you did something weird, then it was a different situation, but right. I never had that situation right. of anyone trying to cross the line with me, except it may be a boy on a team who you could easily right. punch. I mean, you know what I mean? Right. <laughs> not, not, not a coach. <laughs> right. yeah. I think that what you described, though, is what Tony said about it speaks to threshold, right? And that because boundaries are all about what's comfortable, what's uncomfortable, what's acceptable, what's not acceptable, what the individual person's needs are and their ability to be able to address them effectively. So I want to because we in eight minutes time, told y'all time goes by crazy, crazy, crazy fast. But so I just want to touch on. So I'm not going to go into detail about the sexual boundaries because it's freaking Captain Obvious. Um, I'll, you know, that's for another show. But what I do want to touch on um, as we're coming close to time to wrap up is, and I think this is powerful, but if, Tony, you keep referencing it's different in 2021. I think it's interesting because let us not delude ourselves into thinking the flip side of the coin. I believe that there's also occasions where athletes violate the boundaries, especially perhaps at the high school and the collegiate level. You know, it's well, you can't say that it's not applicable at the professional level because, you know, sexual harassment, is sexual harassment and all those things. But I, I clinically it's like hmm, when I think about some of the mental health issues that people have attachment disorders and personality disorders and mood disorders and all of these things, it becomes very easy for someone that is suffering from some degree of mental illness to misread things or to um, have unhealthy attachment to a coach or a trainer and all of these yeah, sorts of know, things. I see that a lot, it's e especially- like, I was gonna ask you, do you, have you all ever seen that? Especially with my dad, with daddy being a coach. Mm -hmm. my dad being a coach mm -hmm. there was a lot of times but that's different because i guess if ever if you're my dad was a good person he loved to help kids and you yeah yeah to do anything but this mm -hmm. if the coach is someone who you don't know what their character is or yeah moral, i mean you know yeah you would have oftentimes even in, in high school which i always thought was funny he never mind you don't want a boy to spend the night but if they were on the track mm -hmm. team mm -hmm. and it was for him <laughs> So he would always be having some of the kids on the team coming over. My mm -hmm. mom is making all these snacks and not just for me. Do, but do what the auntie do. Feed the food. The, the, half the team's parents don't come. Don't send them yeah. with no food, water. They send them to yeah. from 8 a.m. to 8 p.m. with yeah. no food, water, or anything. I have right. $5. You know, it's track. You need a strict diet. 
Yeah. You had anything? They didn't give you anything. Okay. Right. So now we're providing all of this food for the team, whoever had doesn't yeah. have stuff and they need rides and they're coming over and they're with my dad all the time. It's like my dad is their dad. You know? Right. So right. if he was to abuse his power, he, they're coming over our house all the time. Who knows what he could be doing to them if he wasn't, right. you know? But yeah, if he wasn't a good person. Players, like Correct. You said, the, the player's perspective. The, once I did become a certain level of, of good, I realized there were things I can get away with. I'm not mm -hmm. coming, I'm not running as fast as the 12th man on the team when there's coming to practice and stuff. You know, yeah. so like when she said the players would, you know, run and do, if there was a time, oh man, Tonight, I'm going to, I'm not going to go, go to practice because I just don't feel like it. Now, mm -hmm. as a good player, you always want to do that. But I knew I didn't have to do certain stuff because I knew my coach wasn't going to get mad at me or mm -hmm. yell at me because I knew he needed me in the game. Yeah. There was, yeah. you know, those coaches that they literally, if you're not there, if on time, you're one minute late, it doesn't matter if you're good, if you're bad, mm -hmm. you're done. Mm -hmm. So I'm just saying there are there are things when you become a player, you kind of, mm -hmm. oh, you know what? I walk around campus totally different than yeah, the yeah. 12th man walks around campus because yeah, like, yeah. I know you know me. You know, mm -hmm. when, when I come, I, I don't have to pay to, for food when I go into the cafeteria. Right. You Ronnie used to talk about that all the time, how players got preferential treatment. The, the starters. The I just literally used to walk in like, you know, people swipe their car. Oh, I haven't swiped my card in three months. Because <laughs> I'm just looking at the dude and he's opening the door. Whereas a guy may have paid his full, you know, and now yeah. he got to come in or something. So or with missing classes and homework and your grades. All types of boundary violations. Are, we have mandatory uh, study hall. And we mm -hmm. go to study hall and half the basketball team ain't even there. It's like, man, it's supposed to be mandatory. And it's like some random yeah, granted, The like, joke is on you when you fail your class. But that, but that's, they, they I had people, to learn that. They got people doing their work for them. Yeah. They got two wow. It's like they provide them with every opportunity to be, because they're the star. Wow. 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 I didn't abuse my power like that. And I was not the star when I got to college. But mm -hmm. in high school, I mean. I guess you could do that in high school too. Now, if oh, heck yeah. To do heck that, yeah, you do it in I high was school. I of high school, but I just yeah. wasn't, I, you know, I just wasn't that mentality. type of kid. But we're saying those are the opportunities as athletes you to abuse all types of boundaries to take care of, you know. Yeah. You know. There wow. was other people like, even, I'm not going to lie, even when it comes to like, and to be honest, dealing with girls or something like that, you mm -hmm. would think, oh man. Uh, when we walk into a place or something, you know, mm -hmm. the girl may be over here minding her business, but because I feel as though I am, you know, a certain mm -hmm. uh, way, I'm, a, I'm, I'm basically a, the king on campus. Mm -hmm. I should, I feel as though I can talk to you, even yeah. though you're not doing anything, or you, you look like you, you may be at the library. <laughs> and guess what? Yeah. Now I'm here sitting down talking to you. Hey, how you doing? Would you like to go out? I'll up in her personal out. space. <laughs> <laughs> wow. <laughs> But yeah. I, I, I'm just saying because I've seen something like that go down. But yeah, me too. Those are the type of boundaries that you can cross as athletes as well. You yeah. mentally think that you're in a place where you know yeah. you don't you're, you're above the law pretty much. Yeah, yeah. So look, as we're we're wrapping up, um, goodness gracious, we're down to two minutes. I'm, I'm just gonna close us out and and thank you both. So y'all save money's Bun buns today. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. What a robust conversation. I'm gonna let y'all know y'all did Ronnie proud. He Ronnie is my, as you know, he's my co-host, a former scholar athlete, played football as the center at Virginia State. And um, again, you know, prayers out to he and his family. Um, real quick before I, I close out with the boundary piece, I also want to um, express our deepest condolences for the Wright and Frank family. Um, our coach uh, at Salem High School in Salem, New Jersey, where I am from, um, our head football coach lost his mother uh, earlier this week. So our deepest sympathy and condolences out to Montre Wright and the Wright and Frank family for the loss um, of Montre's mother. And uh, he already knows if, if he needs anything, I'm, I'm only a phone call away. Um, our, our deepest, deepest condolences and our prayers are with you, so sorry for your loss. Um, prayers out to Ronnie and his family as he's uh, trying to get some things taken care of. He had a, a last minute emergency that he had to deal with. 
Um, look, folks, it has been a fantastic show. I am so thankful and so grateful that I have, um, that I hail from a family of scholar athletes and that um, Kelly and Tony extended so much love and grace in, in bailing Noni out today and, and looking out. And I really appreciate it. A very powerful, powerful conversation. I could not have done this without you. It's kind of hard to talk about boundaries when you talk to these. And I've done shows by myself, but not with this type of topic, right? It needed to be this fluid exchange. Um, the, the highlight that I want to give to our viewing and listening audience as we wrap up is that I want to make them aware of when boundaries begin to erode, right? So it, it actually starts very simple. It's in, you know, engaging with, you know, athletes and, and coaches and trainers, friending each other on social media and sharing phone numbers and having conversations that are not athletically related and finding time alone um, to, you know, it's like, be careful about giving rides when it's just the coach and the, the, the athlete and, and that sort of stuff, especially, you know, it, it doesn't make a difference nowadays which sex it is. It's just not wise to do that sharing personal email addresses, corresponding about things that have nothing to do with sport, um, sharing gifts that are beyond, you know, that appropriate level of, of funding. Um, be mindful that when it comes to these boundaries, it's all about social, emotional, physical, verbal. And, you know, as, as you said, we, we've had to, to deal with this whole sexual piece for years and years and years now. So we can't, you know, dismiss that as well. But the bottom line is there has to be conversation about it. There has to be clinically what we call psychoeducation. There has to be information that parents, to your point, Tony, parents need to be actively involved and understand that athletes need to feel a level of comfort in advocating for themselves and asserting themselves and feeling safe to be able to do that. Parents need to create a safe space for their children to disclose to them that something may be going on that they're not comfortable with. And everybody has to, to be accountable and take responsibility for this um, because it can do a significant amount of damage when these boundaries are violated. They have to be in place, they have to be understood. And to Tony, your point, there has to be consequences for these boundary violations in and outside of sport, but particularly within the context of sport. Being a superstar in sport is not, um, doesn't mean that someone has a right to violate you and it doesn't mean that you have a right to violate. There has to be mutual uh, responsibility across the board. So thank you so much for joining me today. Folks, that's it for today. I am sports mental health empowerment coach, Dr. Lauren Pitts. This is HT pregame. We'll see you back next Saturday. Thank you, everybody. Have a good weekend. Bye-bye. Happy Labor Day. Bye, Nani. Bye. Bye, Cairo. Uh, Bye, Tony. <laughs>